Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to WIF Academy. Today, we have with us the pan law panel here, which consists of Rohan Khanna, Priyam Sharma, and Mikhail Nam. Rohan is a year two law student. He is the recipient of the Slaughter and May law, uh, Property Law Prize for topping the module in year one. He also holds the undergraduate excellence scholarship. Over the course of the recent spring break, he participated in three insight programs at leading law firms like DLA Piper, Covington and Burling LLP, and Davis, Polk, and Wardville LLP. Priyam is a year two law student. She also holds the undergraduate Global Excellence Scholarship and works as an undergraduate researcher with the university. She's also working with a few startups like the wellness and fitness services provider company Hopster towards raising venture capital. Mikhail is also a year two law student. He also holds the undergraduate Global Excellence Scholarship he has entered with legal uh, leading criminal litigation firm Stoko Partnership and a leading Indian corporate litigation firm Shardal Amarjan Mangaldas. He is also the founder of World of Warwick, a leading student-led publication on campus. Uh, the agenda for today is to discuss certain module-specific and other general preparatory questions for the upcoming summer exams. We would like to begin with the specific ones. So the first question is how to make most the most out of the readings because they are very extensive. This refers to the readings for an essay. Right. Firstly, thank you so much for having me, uh, Pratyush. Um, great. So cr cracking away on the first question, absolutely, the, the readings are very, very extensive. And I think that's a very, that's a hallmark of the of the degree and that's a hallmark of the, of the subject in general. Um, but I think there's a misconception that you have to read everything cover to cover and pay, and, and finish everything. Um, one, I think it's very important to be efficient and selective with your readings. So that means not finishing every single reading, but finding the more most relevant bits uh, and the most relevant pieces of information that are integral to your, the argument that you're making in your essay. Secondly, uh, the university provides reading lists, which are, which are like segregated into core readings, uh, recommended readings and further readings. Um, Again, it's not compulsory or it's not even beneficial to always read everything um, and finish all these readings. And please don't be reading for the sake of reading. I just think that it's important to identify what you're trying to say and use the sources, understand the sources and select the best ones that make uh, your argument the most um, cohesive and the most um, effective. That's about it. Um, just to echo what Johan said, um it's important to read with intention instead of getting through with the reading. Uh, if you're looking for some uh, argument or a counter argument, uh, what I find helpful is to um, look up in the search bar within the document some keywords or terminology or cases for that matter that I can see what different academics are saying about. Um, yeah, um, I think the most important thing is to select your sources correctly. Of course, you have to do the essential readings. That's a bit non-negotiable. But if you're writing an essay or if you're working on your own answers for the upcoming exams, then feel free to venture into other sources that are not included in your reading list. Academics always appreciate that. Right. Thanks to the WIF team, of course, for having me here. Um, just to, again, echo to what uh, both of the panelists have correctly mentioned. Um, to add is that, you know, the law school has been kind enough to very explicitly mention the page numbers that you should actually even focus on. So they will tell you, okay, like look at 101 to 117 and that's the core that you need to really look at. And again, um, you only need to read the things that are more factual, at least in terms of case studies, because they're also word, there's a word limit to it. Um, essay on the other hand, yes, you can uh, delve into, you know, scholarly opinions and so on and so forth. But at least while answering case studies, I think um, focus on the crux, focus on the focus on things that, you know, lead you towards your solution rather than, um, you know, beating around the bush and understanding opinions. So, yeah, read with intention and um, just read things that you understand and you can really apply in your answers. Thank you. Um, the next question is again addressed to the floor. What are the key characteristics of a good legal essay? I'm happy to talk about the, the introduction because I think that's a very, very, very integral part. And I think Priyam and Mikhail can carry on with the body and the conclusion if that's a good structure for you guys. Um, so again, I think the first important point, as I mentioned, is a very clear structure. So there needs to be a clear introduction. There needs to be a clear body. And the body doesn't necessarily have to be titled body. It can just be your the arguments that you're making. And your conclusion is obviously your conclusion. 
So with the introduction in mind, I think the introduction is a very important place to basically make a roadmap of what your essay is trying to say. So you're going to tell the examiner, the person reading your essay, that your what your central thesis is, what your central argument is, and how you're going to go about proving that argument, and then doing so at the end with the conclusion. So an example I'll give you is, if you want to talk about the death penalty, um, say you want to abolish the death, your, your, your position is the death penalty should be abolished. Your first argument could be um, the fact that it's not enough of a deterrent. Your second argument can be that it's not uh, morally correct for anybody to take anyone's life. And these, and you're telling the examiner that these are these are what your arguments are and how you're going to go about making them. And I think that's where a good introduction is. Also, we are, we're often like we, are, we are often have this misconception again that we want to we may, may want to introduce a nice preamble or a nice introduction or a background. But very honestly, I think a very clear, concise, to the point introduction is unbeatable. And I think that's exactly what examiners are looking for when they're marking tons and tons of, of, of essays and entries. So yeah, on, on the introduction side, I think this is what I would um, go about. Um, yeah, just to carry on with the body, there's uh, three things that I think are essential here. Uh, first of all, is having uh, breaking down your arguments into different paragraphs. Instead of writing a narrative flow, you need to break it down thematically and address every paragraph towards a subtopic or sub subtopic per se. Within those paragraphs, you need to make sure that the last sentence of your paragraphs is in some way linking not only to the next one, to the next paragraph, but the general question at hand. So this way you ensure that you keep linking your subject matter to the actual topic instead of going down a rabbit hole about some subtopic that's irrelevant. Secondly, um, what makes the best law essays in my experience is critical analysis and counter arguments. You need to show the examiner that you know that another side exists and it has a valid argument to make. But you, the main point is to show that your argument is still superior because of X, Y, Z reason. So to continue with uh, Rohan's example of the death penalty, let's say you've made all those arguments, but then you also acknowledge that there needs to be a higher threshold of punishment than just life in prison for acts that warrant higher blameworthiness which is why the only option left is death penalty. And then you come back and rebut it again. But is it really a higher threshold? Yada, yada, something like that. And then lastly, what I like to do is put in fun like subheadings. I think it kind of entertains the examiner who has to read like 100 essays. So I kind of make like funny subheadings. That seems to work. I've been complimented on those by an academic before. So I'd be remiss not to mention it. But yeah, that's about it. Right. Also moving on to the conclusion, um, you know, what I think is it's it's like a reverse echo of what the introduction really is. Um, it does. It's three things. So one, it's a reverse echo. And secondly, it's a checklist for yourself. Um, you know, you can revert, you can look back to your introduction and see, OK, I was going to mention X, Y, Z arguments. And you look in your, in, in your conclusion and you see, OK, I have really mentioned these two, these three, these four arguments. Um, so it acts as a checklist for you, for you and for the re uh, for the readers. Because you know the reader knows that okay, this is a coherent end. Um, you know the person has mentioned that okay, in the introduction they were going to say these three arguments, in the conclusion they've really also added these three arguments. So it's like an affirmation of what you've really done throughout the essay. And lastly, it's a, it's it's where you really take your stand one final time. You tell the reader okay, this was my stand and this is how I've proved it. And um, yeah, lastly, um, like Priyam said, I do like to, if not punny uh, headings, just have a simple heading. Um, that's at least how I like to do it. Um, primarily because it shows um, the reader that, okay, this is the bifurcation, makes it easier for them to read so that they don't get lost in hundreds of essays or, or just like the thousand or 2000 words your essays are. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Thank you for that answer. Uh... What advice would you give to people writing an essay on tort and criminal law? And how much do you think they should read the case summaries or uh, they should, you know, go ahead with reading the full judgments? Okay, um, briefly on tort and criminal law, I think all of us will agree that these are fairly interesting modules. I think we all, we all really enjoyed studying them. Um, so I'll take, I'll take briefly tort and criminal. So I'll start with tort. I think a uh, really important, I think for any module actually, is to understand the module structure. So tort, if, if I'm not mistaken, focuses a lot on, at least in the first term, on uh, negligence as a, as a tort, basically. So it breaks down the various factors. It, break, it goes from duty of care to breach of duty 
to um, causation and so on and so forth, remoteness and so on and so forth. So it's, it's important to understand firstly what each of these things are, but more importantly, understand that they all constitute a larger, bigger picture. So it's important to understand how the duty of care relates to the breach of duty and how that in turn relates to causation and how once all these once all these sort of criteria are fulfilled, that's when your negligence claim becomes uh, important. And then after that, you know, you, you talk about damages and you talk about contributory negligence, negligence and other, other similar concepts very closely related to it. But I would just say, understand what each of these uh, se sections are and study them in their own right, and then link it back to your, like your general structure. Term two becomes a little more, um, a little more abstract and a little more broad in that sense. It becomes, it, it, if I'm not mistaken, it, it's to do with interference with the person, um, defamation, etc. And as opposed to negligence, which is again a very like heavy topic in term one, which is only one single tort, what they would what they would try to do in term two is cover an entire tort and an entire sort of um, general wrong in one week um, or over the span of one week's materials. So it's important to understand that like, like a lot of inf your, your readings are going to be a lot heavier in your in your second term as opposed to your first term. And you need to revise your and, and uh, revise your career strategy, like your um, revision strategy accordingly. So yeah, that's what taught. And criminal, just very briefly, I think every offense is every week, they're going to give you like a new offense generally, apart from the first few weeks where they talk about actus race and mens rea, which are also important, like different, like foundational pieces of information, found foundational topics. And it's just important to understand what each offense means, what the elements of each offense are, and how they essentially bring up and con and how essentially liability for each offense is created and what the potential defenses are for each um, offense. And again, it's important to understand the structure behind every single legal concept that you're studying. And that's going to help you um, when you do that, it'll help you write your essays. Um, right. I think because the question specifically talks, talks about tort and criminal law, uh, it's important to highlight two differences, fundamental differences between the nature of these subjects. Generally, and this is generally, not specifically, but tort tends to be very case heavy, whereas criminal law tends to be legislation heavy in terms of what the question asks or what your readings are in general. So it's important to understand those two facts, first of all. And then second of all, when you approach a tort essay, your approach has to be very dependent on how the case law has incrementally developed, right? So you can't hip, like hop and skip around what cases came in and changed the precedent. You have to discuss how every case has slowly modified the law. This is especially true for negligence. As Rohan mentioned, that's a big part of the module. When it comes to criminal law, things are a bit more straightforward. You have legislation, some cases, and a lot of academic opinion. So those are your key sources to go to when you're writing those essays. Again, I will. I know I'm repeating myself, but I'll do it on purpose because you need to understand that those two essays need to look very different. If your tort and criminal essays start to look similar in terms of their subject matter of how many cases and how much legislation you're talking about, there's something wrong somewhere, but that's about it, yeah. I think uh, Rohan and Priyam very beautifully have covered pretty much all of it. But to the former part of the question, um, drawing parallels to both the subjects. Um, taught when you go on to write an essay in your exam, you realize it's more story-like, it's more um, connected. And I personally think you need to be very thorough with your um, taught uh, subjects, at least, and uh, bifurcations of what really each topic is, because you might get lost as to what is negligence and what is uh, X amount of damage. Like it, it's it's a very confusing, it's blurred lines unless not you're really thorough and know which case laws go where. With criminal, um, again, echoing what Priyam said, it's very straightforward, it's very legislation heavy. Uh, and you know, you'll be able to navigate it very easily. And now moving on to the latter part of the questions, where uh, I think the question was, uh, should you read complete judgments? And I would sincerely advise against it, uh, personally at least. You don't really need to sit and read the whole judgment. A lot of it is um opinions or bito dictas or just th there'll just be a lot of stuff that you don't really need um and just focus on what really will add on to your argument as such um that is basically your precedence or what the what the judge has to say or what the conclusion is so yeah don't don't sit and read judgments there's a lot of cases and you possibly cannot read so many judgments um especially uh, in term three when you really get into the judgments of all the uh, all the case laws yeah
Thank you. Um, the next question is, what was your rationale behind module selection to make your course more tailored towards a career in commercial law? Okay, yeah, um, cool. So I'll talk a little bit about my my personal module selections, and then I'll talk about modules that help with commercial law. Uh, my personal module selection, I, I obviously I, that's um, like a personal tidbit is the fact that I am I want to pursue a career. I'm interested in pursuing a career in commercial law, which is why I was sort of motivated and inclined towards taking certain uh, modules that help me just gear me towards that that end goal. Um, which is why I took module of financial service regulations, a very interesting module. Um, I would definitely recommend a module like that. Um, but I also think that uh, the law school, the way that the law school wo works is very, um, it's, it, it focuses on, on the law and the philosophy and the, 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 the literature and the academia behind law more to do with then, um, the, then like practicalities of commercial law and stuff like that, which is fair enough. That's how the law school is designed. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. For those that are interested, I think there are, there is an option of taking external modules. So for example, the Warwick Business School offers a bunch of law modules as well. They offer, if I'm not mistaken, uh, business law, company law, and um, legal entrepreneurship modules like this. So if you're really interested in, in making that um, making that your focus, then by all means, you can take up to 30 cats of external WBS modules, and you can go ahead and, and take those. Um, again, personal choice, but I didn't want to I didn't want to flood my my module selection only with the um, commercial aspects because I didn't want to study what I wanted to what I was interested in as well which is why I took uh, contemporary issues in IP. And the model that I've enjoyed the most studying wise uh, is international criminal law, uh, which is also something that I've really enjoyed. So I just wanted to know, know that I'm doing something that can help me with my, my future and my, my career prospects, but also not burden myself or flood myself with things that I just don't like enjoy studying. So yeah, I would say find a balance between those two. Yeah, I think Rohan perfectly touched upon the different aspects of what goes into module selection. I I don't have data to support it, but I'd say that a law firms are not especially concerned with just how many modules you have that are catered to the commercial world. It's about the value of each module. So as Rohan mentioned, financial services regulation, that's a module that both Mikhail and I had as well. And I think a module like that is very valuable in the commercial setting because it takes you right into what went wrong with things like the 2008 crisis legislatively and legally. So that's something that's super valuable for law firms because they understand that you now at least know a little bit about regula regulatory bodies like the FCA. Um, another, I mean, personally speaking, I was just naturally interested in the commercial ones. Um, I ended up with medicine and the law, which is not something I chose. And I was very salty about it initially, but I've grown to like the module. It's helped me uh, think about things in a different way than I usually do. Um, another side note, I don't think law school students are allowed to uh, enroll for business law modules at WBS or any modules at WBS that are law related because um, for example, the business law module, it's in some part our MELs from year one, modern English legal system, in some part taught and things like that is sort of a construct of things that we've already done. So we'd have an unfair advantage, they think. At least that's what I was told when I asked for it. This may have changed and I hope it has. But yeah, yeah, that's my rationale. Yeah, so with the module selection, I think um, as Rowan correctly mentioned that the balance is very necessary. Um, I really want to get into commercial law and I, I've seen how much, um, you know, FSR, the module has helped me in, um, I, I wouldn't say it's helped you in interviews, but it rather just works as a conversation starter because it, it, it doesn't go into extreme details where, you know, you'd be able to ace a commercial uh, internship or anything of that sort, but understanding the legislations or understanding what goes on behind the 2008 crisis, small things like that you really end up being conversation starters with people you network with or people, or even just an interview that, you know, the person asked, so what are you studying? So that was my rationale. I know I wanted to get into commercial law and I thought I needed at least a certain um, foot in to understand what really goes on. And secondly, with the other optional module was international criminal law that Rowan and I have taken. Um, like like Rowan said, I think that was, that was more of like a passion subject or passion module, something I was really interested in. And, um, but, you know, it, it's a module that is relatively lighter in terms of 
um, how much workload you have because it's very spread out. Uh, although difficult to score, but it's a very interesting project, uh, interesting module that I thought um, I would want. So again, like I, I knew what balance I wanted and how I wanted to split it. And also with module selection, uh, don't keep your hopes up high to always get the modules that you've selected because certain people didn't get the modules that were their first preference at all times. But also don't be disheartened because you also have third year to choose from the same pool of modules. So, um, you know, if you didn't get to say, if you didn't get, let's say, for example, IP in your second year, you can always get it in your third year. So, um, yeah, but I also, also they, sorry, one more thing is they, they say that they don't do it in first come first basis, but I'd still recommend doing it as soon as possible because it looks like it has somewhat worked in that way. So yeah, that's just my um, tips for module selection. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, now moving on, how do you draw parallels between two cases to deploy one as the relevant precedent? Okay, um, so there's a bit of a, I won't say an issue, but there's might be a little bit of confusion with the framing of this question. I think uh, a better way of phrasing this question would be, how do you choose cases which are more relevant towards your, your argument? As opposed, because I think both, there, there are even cases there's a case to be made for both. If, if two cases come together or come at a similar time, we can view both of those as precedents. And it also depends on what the code coming forward would value as a precedent. Because there are a lot of tests in like the, the courts that the courts have to deal with that makes one the precedent over the other. So it, you really can't say which one is going to be the precedent. But um, the point is that you should just, uh, in drawing similarities or differences in cases or parallels between cases, it's important to understand what case, what, what your position is. So for example, a certain test or a certain legal, um, so a certain legal test may point towards your argument, whereas another legal test, which is over the, or the same issue or the same concept, has a different approach and it counteracts or refutes your argument. So, and and these are the and these were applied in different cases, right? So, a good thing is identifying what where the cases overlap, and also highlighting the subtle differences between the cases and the subtle ways of thinking that the court has adopted in arriving at that different conclusion or arriving at that different test, so to speak, and just identify the subtle details between that. So um, again, I think an example of this would be um, in tort law, for example, there's the Wilberforce test in the Anne's case, right? Which um, if I'm not mistaken, it's quite broad or and it, it, like it, uh, sorry, it's quite limited. It, it views um, what's, the, what's the term negligence in, in two lights. So it has a policy test and it has a, a combination of proximity for stability uh, in one in one arm, whereas, whereas the Kaparo test slightly enlarges it, where it it views these as separate sort of uh, criteria. So again, it's important to understand why that's happened, why the courts have thought that way and how they've arrived at different conclusions. And say if you're advocating for a, a smaller or a, or a thinner threshold, then you would go for the, the ANS test or the Wilberforce test, the two-pronged one. Or if you're advocating for a slightly broader sort of more all-encompassing form of um, negligence or duty of care, then you would probably favor the Kaparo test. So it's important to understand what the intricacies and the details are between the two um, cases. Also, it's important to look at the facts of the case. Sometimes decisions turn on the facts of cases as well. And, and the subtle differences between facts of both of the two cases may highlight why a certain outcome or a certain form of thinking developed and, um, as opposed to the other. So yeah, facts, um, principles, and just how the court was thinking at that time uh, is a good way of differentiating case-by-case -case basis and obviously link it back to your argument at all points. Um. I want to look at the original question with what I hopefully interpret is the right intention of that question because it is a bit confusing. Um, there will rarely be an instance where you have to compare which of the two cases is the precedent. Usually it's well understood what the precedent is because there can only be one precedent in one tiny sphere of law. You can't have parallel um, conflicting precedents. So, for example, to take Rohan's example, the Anz and Merton case existed, and then the Kaparo test sort of nullified it. And then from, from Kaparo onwards, it was just Kaparo that was adopted in terms of um, breaking down negligence. So that is one fact that, or one idea that needs to be considered. In terms of comparing cases, I think you have to understand that there is some underlying commonality or difference between cases. That's why there's two of them. There's always something that is going on that is different in one case than the other. For example, I was writing an IP essay 
and uh, there was a case where somebody was not allowed to register a trademark for a uh, color, but on the other hand, somebody else was able to register a trademark for the smell of grass for their tennis balls. We, you'd look at that and say that makes no sense, but then you look into what that underlying common factor was, and it was how distinct those trademarks can be, right? So there's the law is developed in a way with great attention to nuance, and you have to adopt that strategy in your reading of the law as well. But that's about it. Right, and um, you know, like Priyam correctly mentioned that there is no two contradicting um, cases as such. The law has developed in a certain way where there is one pretty, there's pretty much one precedent that you know is going to be right, or there might be a series of precedents that use the same amount of test. Because, like previously mentioned in other questions uh, that we've answered, you don't really go on to explain the whole case. You use the facts of the case, or rather, the conclusion of that case that is the test. So you won't really be scurrying away like okay th this is the test that i need to use or, or is it this precedent or it doesn't matter choose the most recent one or the founding one where the test has been established and you can choose that and secondly even if there's let's say about three cases that have used a similar test and you don't know which one to take i i personally think it's not that important because the law school has room for understanding as to your reasoning of which precedent you've taken um you can choose a precedent and ensure that okay this is the way i have interpreted it and the law school looks at more of your interpretation and your understanding of the law rather than what you've picked out from the law. <clears throat> Sorry. So I think don't get too confused in which precedent to take, but be very factually aware of what precedent you're taking. So there's a thin line, but being well aware of what you're really picking out, which is the test or the conclusion from a precedent is really important. But yeah. Thank you. Um, the next question is for you, Rohan. Given that you topped the property law module and received the slaughter and May prize for it, what was your preparation strategy for the same? Does anyone else want to take this one? I'm joking. Um, no. So, um, yeah, I did top the property property law module. Um, and I think, so I'll, I'll tell you my general approach towards the, 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 the module. And then I'll, I'll talk about what I did in the exam. Cause I think it did, I think it does matter. Uh, and it does boil down eventually to what, how you write the paper and how you give the exam. Um, so I'll, I'll start with my preparation strategy for property law. I think, um, quite honestly and very candidly, I don't think, um, I was reading everything front and back with every single material. For example, um, first, I don't think first years have property law this year. So this might be not that relevant, but I think it might crop up again when you, when you do get it in your second year anyways. Um, so in property law, they taught us various different, um, ideas and ideas around land and property and, and instruments to implement the property lo property laws. For example, there were, we talked about fixtures and fittings, which talk about like whether certain, whether certain thing is part and parcel of a land or whether it is independent of the land. And hence they'll have a lot of other legal repercussions. We talked about easements, how, how on what, on what grounds can you use someone else's land for certain things. Then we had leases and with commonly for houses. So it's important to understand that each of these issues, though interrelated, can be framed in a way that is distinct which means that they may frame certain questions on leases and they may frame questions on easements and so on and so forth. So there is scope for selective study. I will be honest in saying that. So it's important to see what you're understanding the most. Um, and it's also important to study a, a lot of it. But uh, but again, it's not important to go through everything. And I, I honestly did not go through everything. Uh, and I think that served me well. I studied the concepts that I studied really, really well. I went, I went above and beyond um, the course material. And I also like, put my own thinking into, into play, which I'll just touch upon in a second. But I think it's important to firstly zero in on what, what topics you're good at and absolutely nail them and then go about writing the paper. So um, as to the paper, now I attempted three questions. I attempted two problem questions and one uh, essay. And I think what, in terms of the feedback that I got at least, what they really liked is firstly in the problem questions, you obviously you, you apply a certain structure, which we'll get to when we discuss problem problem questions. but. I apply that structure to the way they explained it uh, in the in the in the sorry in the readings as well as the lectures. So they gave us an outline and they gave us a sort of framework to use. And I follow that to the T. Basically, I did exactly what the law school asked me to do. Um, this was in the revision lectures, by the way. So I only really got this framework down when I viewed the revision lectures properly. So that's what I did first. But I think what really crucially set me apart and got me a high got me a high first was the fact that I when I talked in the conclusion for each problem question, I talked about a scope for reform, which is really, really, really favorably looked upon by the law school. 
uh, especially the property law department, they don't want you to, they, they, they're obviously they're testing how much of the law you know, but they also want to know how much of the law you can think about and how much of the law you can critique. So my criticism was very, very, very well welcomed. Um, and that's something that I, I think really stood, stood out for me. As for the essay, um, again, I read above and beyond. I went further, I went further readings. And I think that's very integral to getting a high mark. Um, that's one thing. But secondly, I also, what I think, again, which really stood out and something that they obviously really liked and this is reflected in my feedback was the fact that I linked different topics with one another. So when I was, so I was arguing about what, what was a, a, a theory by, by a, a sort of a Marxist um, thinker by the name of Karl Polyani. And his argument was basically, should we commodify land or not? Should land be a commodity or not? So I argued that, uh, and how is this commodification or anti-commodification process developed, developed in real, in the real world? So what I essentially did there, and I think I, I linked uh, sort of uh, sort of the cases of some some material from my earlier earlier modules, which are not related to this this material, but I, I linked that back into this essay, and I was able to like highlight how how I have a general understanding of the module as a as a whole, as opposed to having an understanding of just you know one one topic or one week's material. And I think what we end up doing is we try to prepare only for one material. Um, but it's also worth noting that we can integrate other week's materials into your answer. So if your answer is on a week three topic, maybe if you can find a link between week four, week five, and try to build that into your um, into your essay or into your answer, that would really be much appreciated by the law school. So yeah, I think obviously there's hard work. You have to get down and 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 grind and do well in your in the ones that you've chosen. But don't try to do it all. Don't try to conquer everything. And Rome obviously wasn't built in one day. So I think it's important to acknowledge that as well. And um, and yeah, that's that's my that was my strategy and my my view towards property law. Thank you, Rohan. It's always helpful to have the topper's view. <laughs> um, moving forward, in essays, how many points of argument should one build to sufficiently answer the underlying question? Um, Priyam, or Mick, if you want to take this, I just spoke a lot. If you want to start us off, that's cool. Yeah, no worries. Um, okay, there should, in, in, it depends on the question. That's where I'll start. It really does, uh, because some questions you have the opportunity to make a straightforward argument. Uh, I think questions within what we're studying this year, which is not really helpful. So let's say something to do with uh, a particular um, piece of legislation, whether it has been uh, developed relevantly or whether it is competing correctly with the social uh, standing of England can be a type of question where you can make a lot of arguments. You can talk about why it's working in one direction and not in another, but perhaps another question that is more straightforward of, does this law need reform? You need one argument which has sub arguments. So you'll either say, yes, it does, no, it doesn't, or it maybe does, you know, something along those lines. And then within that, you'll uh, show your reasons. But what I like to do is have a leading argument and then different ways to look at it. So if my argument is X, Y, Z law does need reform, I can just within my body look at it from different angles as opposed to, yeah, it does need reform, but maybe it doesn't, but perhaps it does. It kind of also depends on how you express your opinions. You have to be clear to the examiner that I'm sticking by my main argument, but I'm also investigating other perspectives towards it. Right. Um, with the essays, there's no fixed number of points that no one can really quantify what is the right number of points and what's not. Um, but you also learn things the hard way. Like I learned this year, actually, the hard way is that in, in EU law, there was an essay on citizenship. Um, and it's a very, very, very broad topic. Okay. There's ranges of cases on um, foreign people. There's ranges of cases on local citizens. And there's, there's so many, so many cases. And then after a point, you'd get confused as to, okay, how many cases can I really cover? And then there's two approaches, which someone who wouldn't score too high would take. One is to either just take one line of reasoning and go on, or take one of each line of reasoning and go on. And I think both don't really make, won't really give you a good high mark, because what you need to do is find that balance of covering range of issues, but also ensuring that in that range of issues, you stick to the main crux of the argument and pick the most important uh, part. Um, again, with uh, with essays, uh, it's it's a very difficult um, line, like Priyam very correctly mentioned, is like, 
you need to be very thorough with your arguments. You need to pick pick one leading argument and then have uh, several sub arguments. And um, yeah, I think again, there's no fixed number of points. It's more of what you think is necessary to convince your readers. Um, but yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah, okay. Um, just to briefly summarize what Mick and um, Priyam said, I think one just general rule of thumb is don't throw everything you know in there. If you have, if you're reaching five, six arguments, then it's really not, they're really not arguments and you can really basically club them in with something else. Um, and there's something definitely going wrong. Secondly, I think I keep saying this. I think this has been a recurring theme of what, what I've been saying uh, is it all depends on what kind of point you're trying to make or what kind of argument you're trying to make. So if you're, if you're making a really broad argument that has various different layers, it's okay to go to two or three arguments and two or three points. But if there's, if there's like one core argument that you want to make and that has, again, as Priya mentioned, few like subsets to it or like subsections there are very, so there's one general idea and then the, within that, there are facets to that idea, then you only have one argument. Don't try to pawn that off as a two as, as two or three arguments. And again, the law school understands this. They'll know the fact that if they're giving you a really broad topic, if they're giving you like a topic, uh, taking, a, taking a mixed example, is certain EU legislation, or so is certain EU case law very broad or very uh, narrow, you basically have two, basically two ideas, right? Are they narrow? Is it broad? You can't, and with that in mind, you can just, everything that you throw in there is going to be a subsection or a facet of something. It's not going to be an independent independent point, right? So it's important to understand, firstly, the law school knows how they're framing the questions. They know that certain topics are only going to have one or two core points. And it, then, then it really depends on how you make those points and how you prove those points and how you exam, like, examine or like examine the underlying issues within them. And they don't, they're not looking for like a lot of different arguments there. And yeah, second thing, th second thing is just basically stay, stay true to your thesis, right? Just don't, don't throw it stuff in there for the sake of throwing stuff in there. And when you know, and when you see that you're detracting too much from your original point, then you know that you've done too much and it may be worth taking a step back and cutting stuff out. So yeah, that's the kind of advice that I would give. Um, thank you. Uh, the next question is what approach would you recommend for problem questions? Do you use the IRAC method or do you have another framework that varies question to question? Okay. Uh, IRAC is a very good, very, very good recommended rule of thumb. So if a certain, and the reason why I mentioned this is a rule of thumb means there might be cases where the IRAC is not the best method. And I'll like elaborate on that in just a second. IRAC is a very good rule of thumb for pla places where there isn't an essential framework. And it's also a very good place for identifying each element. Now I can give you a criminal law and a tort law example. Let's start with criminal law. Um, for the, for the crime of theft, for example, there are various elements. So there's dishonesty, there's intent to permanently deprive, there is appropriation and there are so on and so forth. Now, I think it's important to understand that when you're given a problem question for theft, for example, you have to break down each element, right? Now within each element though, you can sort of implement the Iraq method. This really helped me in my problem question. So when I talked about appropriation, I said, okay, the, obviously the issue is appropriation. Is that, has there been appropriation? The rule then you use is, um, if I'm not mistaken, there was a certain case I can't remember right now, but you apply that rule and then you like make the application of that rule. So, okay, this is the rule. Is it being applied? Is it being correctly applied? Does it stand with these set of facts? And then you conclude and you do, you implement IRAC for each element and then you basically have a full crime. So. What people tend to do is they tend to look at IRAC um, very abstractly. So they tend to like you. So IRAC basically, I'll, I'll explain it as issue, rule, application, and conclusion. So those are that's that's the abbreviation. So what people tend to do is they take a crime or they take a an offense, and then they just start looking at the issues. They list, start listing out issues. But that's very that can lead you astray, right? So I think a good way of doing it is focus on the elements of each offense. And then apply the, and then what identify the core issues, the rules, the application of the rules and the conclusions within those elements. And I think the law school, the textbook is really good. It breaks down each element of the offense really well. And it just makes your answer structured. One more thing before I give it, hand, hand it over to Mikhail and Priyam is the due is, is that IRAC is always not applicable. So sometimes it's not applicable. Sorry. So for example, in tort law and with negligence, again, as I said, there are various different layers to the, to the crime of negligence. There's the duty of care, the breach of duty, the causation, the remoteness, and so on, right? So it's important to say that you don't need to essentially implement IRAC there. You can just go about these uh, these elements in this framework and use it for your negligence problem question. So is there a duty of care? If there's duty of care, has the duty been breached? 
if there's been a breach was that breach a cause of the of the eventual harm was there was a damage damage very remote was it unlikely was it improbable was it foreseeable and then you go on so you don't really really need to use irac there uh you can integrate irac obviously but it's important to like know that for certain offenses certain existing frameworks already exist yeah um personally i haven't found a method that helps me with problem questions more than irac does admittedly uh, problem questions are not my strong suit i much rather prefer writing essays so it's like whatever straw i can grasp on i will so <laughs> irac's been pretty helpful in that i think what rohan said has uh, immense value in that you need to apply irac over and over again within a question especially um in your exams because what you'll find is during your seminars because your uh, study is divided by week by topic you whatever uh, example or question you'll have to get through that week only addresses that topic but in the exam it that's not going to be the case there's going to be if if you take tort it could be a case where in within the problem question they've talked about negligence and defamation or in uh, property law they've talked about easements and something else or like uh, whether the land was registered or not you know um it, it's going to be an amalgamation of the things that you've studied so it's important to keep in mind that the irac is not a one and done method it's it's more so a strategy yes yeah, just building on to that um so i personally am an advocate for irac maths i think it makes the most sense it covers pretty much everything that you need to um it, it's like an essay structure right you you have an introduction which is the issue you have a body which is your rules and application and of course you have your conclusion which is the conclusion so it gives even your problem questions a very um, essay like structure that makes it very easy for the readers to or whoever is correcting your paper for them to really check and understand okay this is the argument they've used the correct uh, rules okay they've applied it this way as well so you know they understand okay the person understands it and obviously they've concluded it properly um yes you have to use irac several times in one because um even even if it's taught but more so actually i've realized in second year if there's any second year washing it happens in contract as well um with contract law you realize that to even prove that it's a contract there's x amount of steps that you really need to prove before so you're going to have to do irac for the first step irac for the second step irac for the third step and then finally move on to what irac is for the whole essay so again yes uh, just to echo again it's not just your whole um answer that's irac rather it's separate uh, sub uh, iracs that really make one massive answer if that makes uh, a lot of sense but yeah that's for it thanks thank you so much uh, we're done with the module specific questions as of yet now we will move on to the general ones so to begin i mean stress is something that's very common place it's a general refrain among all students so what would your suggestion be towards dealing with stress um okay firstly i'd be i'd be shocked if the three of us would were could come out here and say that we weren't stressed because we are i think we're all very very stressed right now with our exams and i think there's a difference and i and i let, i read this in school so it was a pretty cool way of uh, someone like explaining this to me so there's there's stress and then there's distress so when you fall into distress you're you're going to have trouble that's when your productivity is going to be low that's when you're going to give up you're going to burn out and it's very easy to slip into distress stress on the other hand can be positively used as well so you can use it as motivation but as long as it's going to have negative impacts on you i think that's the time where you where you draw the line so one really good way of dealing with stress is reassuring yourself that you can take a break i think as i said rome was in conquer in one day right so i think it's really important to understand that you can't cram everything in one night as much as you think you're a crammer um and it's really important to give yourself that break say that okay i've i finished this um this much right now i'm going to take a break i've earned that break and reassure yourself that you deserved it and then carry on when you're comfortable i think that's one really important way of dealing with stress and second is setting targets for yourself so set realistic targets and even if you fall slightly short of those targets don't beat yourself up, up over it i'm sure you're going to cover it covered up going forward so set realistic healthy targets for yourself and i think obviously then every then up, above and beyond that it's just sleep well, good eating exercise those kind of things so yeah i think um that's how i deal with stress when i'm when i'm really facing it yeah those are all really helpful things um i admittedly really really um 
broke under stress last year. <laughs> I was not sleeping, not eating, not going back to my room, staying in the library for days, literally on end. And did it help me get my first? Perhaps, but was it necessary? Probably not. Um, this year, I'm being a far more uh, considerate of myself and balanced about how I'm approaching revision. And what I've come to find is I don't need to, because of this uh, improved way of approaching uh, revision, I don't need to spend 36 hours in the library. I get my work done within six. Uh, so as Rohan said, sleep is important. One thing that I must tell every law school student is we're infamous for having terrible sleep schedules. And I know it's sort of impossible to avoid late nights, but please, please, please try your best to wake up early in the morning, get some sun, go for a walk, go for a run, come back, work a little bit, and then, you know, work your time through the day and sleep at night. Don't mess up that circadian rhythm. It's not going to do you well in terms of stress. I also heavily advocate uh, finding things that were stress for you. This is something that should have been done before the stress comes on, of course. But for me, uh, the gym is brilliant. I stay in there for four hours and uh, I come out stress-free pretty much. So yeah, find your own thing. Yeah, um, so I think stress is very, very natural. It's very common so much so that I don't know how it feels now without stress during exam time. But um, yes, it's very important to ensure that you don't enter distress. And I think everyone has different ways to deal with it. Um, some people like to work for 36 hours and then disappear and not do anything for 12 hours. Some people like to work for four hours, take a break for two hours and then rinse and repeat. Uh, but at least for me personally, I like to attach at least one extracurricular activity when I'm, um, you know, when I'm studying, maybe gym, maybe tennis, I make sure that in the day I have some me time because it's a, it's a marathon. Okay. It's not a sprint. You're going to exhaust yourself. If you just keep targets for the day, don't, don't cram up everything in just one day and be like, okay, I'm going to take tomorrow off. No, it, it won't really work like that. You may survive a week. Sure. But you have to do it for, let's say over a month and a half all across term three. And take care of yourself. I think that's that's the biggest, uh, most important thing. Maybe sleep schedule, maybe diet, maybe um, maybe you know, just, uh, maybe just taking meeting your friends. I think that's also really important. So yeah, take care of yourself because you have to really, really survive exam season. And even exam writing exams uh, themselves take a toll. So just make sure that you're geared up and you don't over uh, overwork the day before the exam as well. Um, but other than that, I think people should be fine. It's, it's not that hard, also. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how did you balance your time between extracurriculars and academics? Sorry, academics and curriculum. Yeah, so I I mean, I try to balance my time through um, just, again, setting clear targets and expectations, honestly. So I think it's really important to understand that. Um, I think it's really important to understand that there are 24 hours in a day. And as I, and as just like running off the last question, I think it's really important to know that we can't all, always be studying, nor are we going to always be studying. So dedicating time to, um, to extracurricular activities um, and making that time very like rigid and not rigid, but very like specific and established. And also knowing that going back and studying as well is really important. I think it's also important to know that you should you should like space your study out over over time as well. If you're on top of your modules, if you're on top of your lectures, if you're on top of your readings, then you're gonna invariably free up a lot of time for other stuff. See, law school is hard, but it's like it's not insane. Like it can be, it can be, it can be conquered, and you can do well if you put in enough effort. And there's always space to do more. As Mick says, he likes to go play tennis. Priyam is always in the gym. These things are always um uh, like these things are always possible. And I think the only way the only way these guys do it, and I think I do it as well, is all by setting very clear expectations and just being honest and true to ourselves. And if 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 a certain amount of time has been dedicated to, so we, we were all in WIF, right? So if a certain time was dedicated to WIF work, then that's it. WIF work is the only thing that's going to be on our minds in those in those in that much time. But we know that beyond that, and I, I think everyone in societies also agree that beyond that, time is to be dedicated to studies as well. So if you are setting clear expectations, then I think it's very hard to to waver. And, um, and yeah, that's how, that's how I like to balance my, uh, my, my extracurriculars with work. Yeah. I think, um, one thing that I really like to think about when I'm, uh, trying to balance things is, uh, 
that I can do everything, just not everything all at once. So you can have a social life, you can do well in your academics, you can have a thriving career, you can have thriving hobbies, but you can't do it all within the same week or the same day, you know? So the way I approach it is by segmenting months. Um, like the next three to four months, I'm not three to four months at this point, well, time really hit, but like two to three months, I'm probably not going to be very focused on any society work. I'm probably not going to be super dedicated to going out and partying. It's going to be studying and career stuff towards the tail end of the two months, right? So that doesn't mean that I spent my year inside my room and didn't do anything. I did my fair share of partying and I did my fair share of society work when the time was right. So you just have to segment your life in whatever um, little biscuits of time that makes sense for you. And I also think you need to be very aware of what your core activities are um, throughout the year and during exam times, because I don't really recommend you changing your schedule completely during exam times. Um, like I personally am a morning person, but I don't think during exams, I would try to really change my schedule and do it all, all through the night and just work through the night. It, it, it won't really work. It won't fit with your body. And um, do the core activities. Ask yourself what's really important for you to really survive the day or survive uh, the week. Um, for me, it's like it's tennis or pre it's gym or what, whatever it might be. You know, don't don't compromise on certain activities because that's really important. Um, and again, your schedule is the most important thing. Um, put it on your whatever soft board or it is that you see it in the morning. You know your targets. And even if you can't set targets for a month, do it for a week. If not for a week, do it for three days or a day. So at least you know you get up with a goal. And you don't feel disappointed at the end of the day. You don't feel wavered. You don't feel lost by the end of the day. I think that's the most important thing. But yeah, do take time. And like Priyam, again, very, very correctly said, you can't do everything all at once. So it's very, very important. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how important are first-year grades while applying to vacation schemes? Okay, that, this, one's a, this one's a toughie because I think we clearly we really don't know obviously we can't give you a decisive answer so don't take our word as gospel but i think i think obviously it plays a part i mean if they're asking if they're asking for it it's definitely gonna have some some say but i wouldn't beat myself up over a 2-1 either uh is, is is my is my point so it's good so my my entire point is obviously go and aim for that first i think that there's a reason why firsts are there and are in, and are in place um it's obviously to distinguish yourself it's a, it's a good tool to distinguish yourself and maybe if if they don't like directly consider it like rigidly consider it it's a good way of talking in, your, in one of your interviews or so in, in one of my telephone interviews I, I chatted about uh they asked me why i was resilient and I, and I was and i was able to say that um i've adapted to a new a new culture a new climate a new educational sort of um atmosphere and i've been able to do well in it and then i was able to substantiate by that by saying i've got a first or i've topped a module something like that so it may not have a direct play or have a direct impact on what you're th on what like on whether you're getting the job I don't think it does I think law firms are more than happy with the 2-1 as a sort of a threshold thing but I think there's no downside to really going and digging deep and trying to get that get that first even if it doesn't have a, a very like direct or a system systematic sort of way of differentiating you um it'll still be a good way of very implicitly differentiating you basically is what I'm trying to say yeah, what Rohan said makes a lot of sense. Um, your first or lack thereof is not going to make or break your application. Um, your two one might, but not your first. Uh, most law firms, as he said, are happy with a two one uh, because, and I think you need to understand why that is. The study of law and the practice of law are two different ball games. They don't necessarily translate well into one another or seep into one another, but. Uh, it sort of comes down to why you want that first. Do you actually want that first? Because you want to truly engage with the material and test yourself and see whether you're able to perform under tough conditions with some new academic knowledge that you never had before. That's at least what was my motivation towards the first. Um, but it's also important to mention that you don't need to be motivated to get a first or aim for that at all if your priorities are I. I'm not super encouraged by the study of law, more so interested in the practice. In that case, I'd say dedicate more of your time to your career strategy as opposed to 
spending hours and hours and hours with your books and doing the not the bare minimum but the bare more than minimum i'd say yeah i think um, with in with regards to your marks it's just a star on your paper or your cv that someone looks at for 3 to 5 seconds okay how much of a difference is it going to make to what you bring to the firm is very less and again they've rowan and priyam have answered from a um applicant's perspective i'm going to give a more of a um you know the firm's perspective or the recruiter's perspective is that okay you've scored a first but how does that distinguish you from what you're going to bring to the practice other than just theoretical knowledge and like priyam very correctly mentioned that practical a practical uh, law and theoretical law very very two different things and from my vacation scheme last year i really realized that what i studied in criminal law played pretty much 4% 5% of a difference to how much i really um worked in a criminal law firm um and more so it comes down to how you answer what your outlook is on um you know certain legal topics or maybe some uh, current affairs or so on and so forth um again your marks they'll look at it and they'll ask like one said it's a conversation starter fair enough but other than that it doesn't really make a difference um the first is yes of course an additional advantage but like firm say they very they very clearly say they never say get a first they say score a minimum of 21 which means that's just an entry level thing they they look at it and then they forget about it and most of the times when you go to an ac which is the final round on assessment center um you get a blank the recruiter gets a blank um blank i don't know what things what exactly it's called but essentially they don't see your marks they don't see which university that you've gone to they don't see which um firms you worked at they just look at you for what you are and what you bring to the table and that's the most important stage of an application of you securing an a vacation scheme and your marks not being there uh, i think speaks a lot already and i think that chance your question thank you for that answer uh moving on do you have any schedule making or time management tips and how would you recommend that one deals with modules that have very close deadlines or exam dates to others okay um the answer the, the honest answer would be no because i don't i'm not a timetable person i don't sit and make timetables because it'll just again add to the stress when i don't when i don't hit those targets so i'm just personally not a timetable person but i can answer this question like in in a, in a roundabout way by saying that um i always know something i always know what i need to do in my mind so i, I have a very good uh, i would like to say a very good awareness of of where my deadlines are and my and i can implicitly in my mind plan how i'm going to go about studying things so um that basically means that i know that i have a certain amount. so right now i have an essay coming up in um, on monday uh priya and i have essay coming up i think on monday and uh the way we do that the way i'm doing that is without making a timetable i just know that i have to finish i know that i've, I've broken down my argument into three three sections i know that i have to finish the section by my first section by today my second section by tomorrow and my third section by day after that's just an idea that i have in my mind i don't and even if i don't necessarily finish it i can i i always do enough that i can cover up the next day and save enough time so on some days i might be working less on some days i might be working more and i think this having a, a good mental idea of it um is really is really helpful and i think that that's true for even timetables right so even if you're making a timetable or writing it down on paper it's only going to work uh, until like up until the fact that you actually try to think about it and actually have a mental sort of awareness and a cognizance of that so that's how i like to do things and for like close deadlines and things like that i just think that it's it's a matter of putting everything aside and, and focusing on your studies we're all here for a reason i'm sure if if you're watching this you you are academically inclined and you are caring about your studies so for things that come really close to one another just say okay listen i'm not going to i'm not going to go out for that 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 party i'm not going to go uh for that game of football i'm not going to you know spend some time on netflix or watching watching shows i'm going to go and do my work so i think it's just keep telling yourself that and then following through and prioritizing your studies for close deadlines there's nothing you can do about it law school has to compromise somewhere and you may be unlucky with really close exams it's just about telling yourself at that point that's that's what i would say um yeah i i think this is a good place for me to mention that rohan and i are polar opposites in this term and maybe that's super helpful to you guys listening because you're either one of us um i will i i cannot function without a plan and by and, and i'm not great at keeping it in my head i will lose track of it um 
So I need everything written down and out. Like even right now from where I'm sat, I can see seven sticky notes that are that have tally marks for how many study sessions I'm supposed to do and how many of them I have completed for this week and the next coming week. So that's how rigorous I like to be with it. But obviously that that's a bit maniac. I don't recommend that. Um, what I recommend is recognizing which person you are or whether you lie somewhere in between. Um, and let yourself be that person. If you don't like writing things down and you think that stresses you out, then don't do it. It's not going to be helpful. Um, on the other hand, if you're like me and you need everything planned out, then do it. Um, there's a lot of tools for it. Notion is great. Just a simple table on your docs is good enough. I like to have it physically so that it, there's a physical reminder within my room that I need to get some work done. Um, in terms of when things are too close together, as Rohan said, you need to put your foot down and be strict with yourself and discipline yourself and tell yourself to do the right thing. But also get enough sleep because nothing will worsen your performance than lack of mental clarity between two different subjects. Like you, those are two different areas of knowledge within your brain that you're trying to access. Think about it that way. And you'll recognize the importance of mental rest and sleep. Don't just jump from one thing into another. Give yourself time to tune out of the first thing and then tune back into the second one. Yeah, um, so I resonate a lot with Priyang when it comes to scheduling. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a freak who likes to write a lot uh, about my schedule. And I, I like it's not it doesn't always work as I have planned. <clears throat> By the end of the week, you'll realize, OK, I put a little too much on my plate. Next week, you have, to, you have to improvise and you have to realize and you need to be self-aware. that Okay, this is my capability and don't push yourself so much so that you then by the end of the week feel disappointed that you've not uh, reached that certain level. <clears throat> and with terms of making, in terms of making schedule, I'd suggest writing it down. If you really want to remember it, don't put it on a laptop. Fine, you can, you can schedule it on a laptop if you feel like it. But initially, when you're brainstorming, do write it down it really sticks in your head and that's one thing i've made a change because first i used to write on my ipad or i used to like put it on my um google docs and, and i realized that writing it down really affirms it in your head and that's very important and in terms of close deadlines um i think again self-awareness is very important you know you need to know when okay this is enough but you also need to know that then you see when two things are very close it also adds on to the stress and you might hit that distress button so ensure that even though the two deadlines are closed, don't overspend on your academics, but also don't take it too easy. Um, find that balance. I think balance is very, very important consistently throughout the year. And that's what really uh, makes you, you know, get that first or a high to one or at least to one. But yeah, consistency is really important and self-awareness also. So I think that's about it. Thank you so much for all of your answers. I think with that, we'll come to an end of this wonderful discussion. And it was really great having you here. Thank you so much for all your time. I know law is a very busy degree. You gave us about one hour out of that. Thank you so much. Thank you.